Dr. Harry Fletcher is no stranger to those of you who attend our Wednesday evening service. He has spoken on a number of occasions over the last five years. God has used him in a profound way in a number of different ministries. He spent 57 years in prison ministry on and off. Currently, he serves as the president of Good News Jail and Prison Ministry, and we are privileged as a church body to partner with him as we help to underwrite the expenses of that organization. Uh, he spent 30 years in the pastorate, seven years in academia as the president of Capital, Washington Bible College and Capital Bible Seminary, where some of my friends attended. Uh, he has had a great impact as a Bible teacher. I would say if there's anything when I've heard him that characterizes him is he is an expositor of the Word of God, and that's what changes lives. His wife of 57 years, Muriel, is with us. We're so pleased. Muriel, God bless you. He has uh, two daughters, two son-in-laws, of course, six grandsons, and one great-grandson. I'd like you to welcome Dr. Harry Fletcher. Harry, come if you will. Dr. Brogy. And uh, it's such a pleasure to be back here at Community Bible. We live on Cape Cod, and uh, we work out of Orlando in January and February, and Hilton Head Island in March. Somebody's got to do it, right? And so we've chosen to do that. But uh, it's always one of the highlights in March of uh, coming to Hilton Head is being with you people. And it's always been such a delight. Your Wednesday evening service is really uh, quite an unusual Wednesday evening service for churches because it's like a full service and it's just spectacular and, and uh, enjoy it so very much. Now I know your pastor's been speaking uh, on prophecy and so if I say anything, if I say anything that is contradicted what he says, my advice to you is listen to him, all right? Or go check his tape out. If you're confused about something I say, I'm sure you'll get straightened out then. Uh, we are going to look at uh, another prophetic message, um, and I invite you to turn to what I would uh, call one of the most difficult portions of Scripture, uh, Ezekiel uh, chapter 38 and 39. I was a brand new Christian. I didn't know that there were four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I had been in the Army and out of the Army, came home, was at Indiana University, got saved. And then I was taken to a church, and there was an evangelist uh, that became a pretty well-known Bible teacher, especially prophetically. And of all places in the Bible where he turned for this person that didn't even know the difference between New and Old Testament. It was Ezekiel 38 and 39. And the amazing thing is this, and it's not that I'm smart, I'm not, I'm a hard worker, but uh, I'm not what you call rocket scientist. But he put the cookies on the table so wonderfully that I was able to sit there and follow through exactly what, his, what he was saying. His name was Jack Van Impey, and perhaps you've heard of him, but he was just a young, this was back in about 1963, so uh, that's what, 60 years ago, I guess. But anyway, it was just a, a wonderful, and it taught me, it made an indelible impression on me because I remember then being called the ministry, Bible College Seminary, and often, you know, you couldn't teach new believers prophetic truths because they weren't ready to assimilate them. And I always went back to that message that I heard. The other message, the first one I heard, an expository message, was at the same church. And his name was Dr. Richard Sumi. He became the chaplain at Dallas Theological Seminary before he went to be with the Lord. But I remember that man in Emmanuel Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia, and he gave such reverence to the pulpit and to the Word of God. And I can see him still walking kind of back and forth. He was preaching on Nehemiah chapter 3. And I'm, again, a brand new believer, but it made a deep impression, too, of the respect for the Word of God in the pulpit. Uh, so those two indelible impressions. Uh, you don't have to be a seasoned saint 
to understand prophetic truths. And you've been learning that through the series that Dr. Brogy's uh, been delivering to you. And uh, I hope to uh, add a little bit uh, uh, to it as well this, this morning. Someone said that Christians treat the subject of biblical prophecy like the priest and the Levite treated the wounded man in the parable of the Good Samaritan. They simply pass by it on the other side. Others avoid prophecy because it seems too difficult to understand. Then there are others who feel too overwhelmed, they say, by the present. And how can they think about the future? I've had some dark times in my life, a few of them. But losses like you, pain. And you know, one of the things that always pulled me through were the reflections on the prophecies of God and the future and the blessed hope and the reunion with loved ones if you lost loved ones. I'm 80 years old, and I'm the youngest in my family of seven children. Does that tell you how ancient my brothers and sisters are if I'm the baby? And a few of them are on the other side. Thought we we're going to lose another one here just a week or so ago. And so to me, reflecting and meditating on prophetic truths is a wonderful comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words, right? That comes right from the lips of the Apostle uh, Paul. But you know, the other thing I hear more about why prophecy is avoided, and it comes from pastors, is they don't see its relevance in everyday life. And that is so sad, it's even pathetic, because it's such a motivation. A, to know Christ as your Savior. B, to walk with him as the Lord of your life. To make your life count, knowing that while salvation by grace through faith is free, it's the gift of God. You trust in the finished work of Christ and his glorious resurrection. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to your account. Those are such wonderful truths. But then to realize as a Christian from the day I'm saved to the day I go to be with Christ, I will give an account of my life as a Christian, not to decide whether I go to heaven or hell, that was decided at the cross, but to hear about my life before the Lord as it relates to my words, my works, and my faithfulness, and to stand before the Lord and to give account of that. So prophecy is an incredibly relevant subject. Now, while many Christians are content to leave prophecy's pages shrouded in mystery and uh, misunderstanding, it's the only reliable information we have today about the future. I mean, who doesn't want to know what tomorrow holds, what the future holds? And the only way we have a sure record of it is right here in this blessed word. God has given us a sure word of prophecy. The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 1 that the, uh, the, the prophets inquired diligently about prophetic truths. And then this, these verses have always captivated me. When Peter writes in 2 Peter, he said the prophecies recorded in this book, the Holy Bible, they're more reliable, Peter said, than what he saw with his own eyes and what he heard with his own ears. I was there, I saw him baptized. I saw the dove descend. I heard the voice. I was on the transfiguration. I heard the voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Peter says, I want you to know something. My ears could lie. My, what I heard could not be exactly true. But I can say this. As holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And this book was trans, uh, not only translated for generations. But recorded it in spiritual writings without one error whatsoever. He says this is even more accurate than anything a man could see or hear. And so rest upon uh, the truths of this inerrant word. It will not leave your mind void. Peter said, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed 
to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. So with that in mind, let's go to Ezekiel 38 and 39 to a prophecy that I refer to as the coming Islamic invasion of Israel. Now, it was a few months ago where this picture on the screen uh, was, I, I think I saw it on the internet right uh, during this meeting, and it's when Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, deepened his ties with Iran and Turkey when he met with Ayatollah Khomeini and President Erdogan of, of Turkey. And a few minutes you'll know why that picture uh, caught my attention. Having said that, let me just give you two principles that I find have been helpful to me through the years. And any time I teach on prophecy, I always like to share these uh, two uh, thoughts about it, principles of interpreting prophecy, uh, that I think will keep you from going into a wrong direction. The first principle is this. Examine current events in light of biblical prophecy. But do not read biblical prophecy into current events. Now, in a sense, I'm going to violate that this morning because I'm talking about a coming Islamic invasion, and you'll see why I call it that in just a couple of minutes. But then there's a second principle that pulls me back and keeps me in check, and here's that principle. When the time arrives for a prophecy to be fulfilled, the current events and the prophecy will align themselves together. So I hope you can see what we're trying to say here. What we're trying to say, as you look around you, don't go to a mistaken conclusion and say, now I know when Christ is coming back. You don't know that. The current events seem to align with it, but you don't know for certain. The hour and the time no man knows, said the Lord Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, be a discerning Christian, know your Bible, and know that the things that come together when the prophecy is fulfilled don't normally happen overnight. That it takes years for it to come together, especially when you're dealing with nations, and like we're reading in this passage. So I think those two principles might, might be of help to you as you study biblical prophecy. So this is the coming invasion of Israel that uh, is talked about by the prophet uh, Ezekiel. And if God's program is delayed, then perhaps the t correct title of the message might be something other than the Islamic invasion. And I'll try to treat that in, in just a few minutes. What you need to know for certain is this. Not one thing has to happen in the prophetical scheme of things. Not one thing has to happen in order for the Lord to return for his church. That event you and I call the rapture of the church comes from the Latin word rapturo, which means to be caught up. And that takes you back to 1 Thessalonians 4, that we're going to be caught up in the air. Christ is not coming back to earth at that time. His feet will not land upon planet earth. He catches us up out of this world, the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. The dead in Christ who have died since Pentecost in the Lord will come with him. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so that's the rapture of the church and that's what we're looking for as the next prophetic event that will then unlock the timepiece of Daniel's prophecy that you studied from Dr. Brogy and Daniel and, and uh, other messages. And so we're looking for that 70th week of Daniel to begin, but we won't be here for it. But immediately after the church is raptured, that seven years of tribulation, Daniel's 70th week is going to begin. So here's how I like to liken it. When I was in, living in Washington, D.C., one of the things we loved to do as a family is go to the Kennedy Center. And our favorite play as a whole family musical is Les Miserables. 
I think we went two or three times. But you go to the Kennedy Center, it was just kind of like a once a year event. And then you park down on the uh, ground floor, and then you go up to the second floor, and you got this restaurant, we'd have dinner, looking at the, uh, the, all the monuments around you. Just a, you gotta love Washington, D.C. and its history. And then after dinner, we'd go down to the first floor, and that's when the music will take place. So you get in your seat, all the actors and actresses are already on the stage. They're behind the curtain. Orchestra is right there. They're down in the pit. And there's one thing you're waiting for when you sit in your, in your seat. You're waiting for the curtains to open. And once the curtains open, then it proceeds from there. Now, I liken the curtains opening to the rapture of the church. Because all the actors and actresses for the end times, it seems, at least, are on the stage, or appears they could be on the stage. All the nations, Israel's back in the land, 1948. The Jews are back in their homeland. So everything is said, all we have to do is wait for the curtain to go up. And when that curtain goes up, I want you to imagine a big clock there on the screen. And God had a time clock of prophecy. And it began... Uh, way back in the Old Testament, and the book of Daniel 9, 24 to 27 tells you, tells you about it, 70 weeks it talks about. And it began at a certain time in Nehemiah 2 and it ended with the rejection of Christ. And God's time clock of prophecy, 70 weeks are determined upon the Jews and the holy city. 70 weeks, and when you talk to a Jew or an Israelite, a week can be seven days, like you and I. I say, how long's a week? You say, well, seven days. I ask you, Jew, how long's a week? It can be seven days or it can be seven years. So you can have a week of days or you can have a, a week of years. And in Daniel's prophecy, it's clear a week of years. 483 were fulfilled. Those are past. But it leaves one week of years, which is seven years long, and that's Daniel 70. That would depend, that would de uh, begin after the rapture of the church, and we're caught up to be uh, with the Lord in the air. Now, many Bible scholars say this is a difficult passage, and I agree. Joel Rosenberg, though, wrote this Bible prophecy can be difficult, but it's not designed to be unknowable. And so God wants us to know about these things that will motivate us. It's hard to believe that you could turn on the news in the evening news time or whenever you listen to it, and you can hear people talking about the problem in the Middle East has finally been resolved. Uh, there's been a peace accord made. Israel and the Palestinians are not living in hostility any longer. A treaty has been made. And that treaty is guaranteeing Israel to a time of peace that they have never known before. It's not the American president that's going to make it. It's not the leader of the uh, United Nations. It's the leader of a 10-nation confederation out of what we would call the United States of Europe, which we could also see as the revived Roman Empire. And the leader of that 10-nation confederation is going to be the most powerful military and economic and political powerhouse in the world at that time. And he's the one that comes and he makes this peace treaty in the Middle East. Now, I think that's going to be the He's going to win the Nobel Peace Prize. He's going to be Times Man of the Year. And everyone's going to look at him with adoration because he is a man of peace. And he has brought peace finally to the, uh, to the Middle East. Now, look at it, Daniel 9, 27. It's on the screen. It says this. And now he's going to make a covenant, a peace treaty with Israel, and it's going to seemingly bring harmony, uh, harmony stability, and protection to this strife-torn region. Then he, who is that? That's the leader of the Ten Nation Confederation. He's also called a man of sin. He's called the man of lawlessness. He's called by John as the Antichrist. He goes by a lot of different names. But he's, just think of the world, the person who's leading the Ten Nation Confederation that brings and signs the peace treaty with Israel. And the world is looking to him as probably the most powerful military political man on the world at that time. It says, he shall confirm a covenant with many, that's in Israel, for one week. That's a week of years or for seven years. 
But in the middle of the week, after the first three and a half years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. That is such a key sentence. In the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple, uh, Israel, etc., the disciples went up to the Mount of Olives and they said, and it was especially James, Peter, and John, said, When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And then Jesus talks about wars, rumors of wars, and then he say, makes this statement. Now listen, these are the beginning of sorrows. I think that's a determining point there. That's the first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period. And then he says things will get worse. It's going to really get bad. And he says, then shall the end come. But then he adds this word. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, there it is. That was spoken 500 years earlier. Now Jesus says 500 years later, when you see the abomination of desolation, all hell is breaking loose against Israel. Don't even take time to pack. Get your family and get out of Jerusalem. That's basically what he said. You can read it in Matthew chapter 24. And so in the middle of this seven-year peacetime, the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel. And now instead of a time of relative peace, first three and a half years, stability, protection, it's three and a half years of Jacob's trouble, or what Jesus called the Great Tribulation uh, Period. Now, the other thing I want to, or two things I want you to notice, and I'm going to move quickly. It says in verse 27 of Daniel, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, who are the many? Well, it could be the many people who are in Israel. Some believe that's what he's talking about. You and I know the problem in the Middle East is not just an Israeli-Palestinian problem. They often refer to it as what? The Middle East problem. Because you have a lot of Palestinian refugees who are living in all these other countries right around the country of Israel. And so the dilemma is, how can Israel and the Palestinians live peacefully uh, together? And so it could be that when he confirms the covenant with many, while the key is Israel, it also involves these neighboring countries. Now you notice also in this verse 27, it says, in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now what's that tell you? Without stating it uh, explicitly, if they're going to stop the sacrifice and offering in Jerusalem, then that tells you there was obviously a temple there, a Jewish temple that's been built. Otherwise, you can't have sacrifices and offerings. So perhaps, perhaps underlined, I don't know this to be true, it is part of the covenant the Antichrist makes with Israel. I'm going to protect you. You don't have to worry anymore. We're the most powerful military there is in the world. We will protect you. And the Jews then ask for one thing. We need a place to build our temple. Maybe that's part of the covenant. But in the, whatever it is, in the middle of the week, after the first three and a half years, he breaks the covenant and he says, no more offering of sacrifices. And you'll see why in, in, in just a minute. Now, any lasting agreement would seemingly have to involve the Middle East countries as well as the nation of Israel. And after decades of war, peace will finally see, be seen at hand in the Middle East. And Israel's weary but possibly joyful response will be finally. At last we can beat our swords into plowshares and focus on economic growth rather than on national security. Our borders are finally secure and we are living in peace for the first time in our existence. And then we hear the Apostle Paul uh, state about this time as well, I believe, in 1 Thessalonians. He says, while they are saying, peace and safety, finally, destruction will come upon them suddenly, like birth pangs, upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So Israel may be at peace with her near neighbors, but other more militant possibly 
Islamic countries who are not part of this peace accord are thinking about doing something else and they take matters into their own hands and launch a surprise attack against Israel. Now, there's about 60 verses in 38 and 39. We're not going to read them all. We're not going to try to examine all. I'm just going to give you a snapshot. Uh, that's, that's an overview of looking at today Israel in a chronological way from this prophecy. Number one, Israel is asleep to God. Israel is asleep to God, and that is, is uh, chapter 38, verses 1 to 13. So here's now, uh, after the rapture, we don't know how soon after. Could be a day, a week, a month, we don't know. But we knew, know that sometime fairly soon after the rapture of the church, it would seem that this uh, Antichrist, the head of the Ten Nation Confederation, makes a peace agreement with Israel promising peace and protection. So that's what we read in Daniel 9.27. Now you got three little images up there that breaks it down for you. Notice in the first you got the shaking of the hands. That's the agreement being made. That's the covenant. That's the promise of peace from the world leader with the nation of Israel. We will protect you. No one's going to harm you because they're not going to mess with us. But after the three and a half years, then you have what Daniel prophesied and what Jesus confirmed when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the temple, in the holy place. Now what is that abomination of desolation? That's when they cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Israel can no longer offer up their sacrifices, the Passover lamb, etc., and instead, Paul then writes to us about this man of sin, the son of perdition, who is the same person, this leader, who John in his chapter, in his book, is going to call the Antichrist. And this person now steps into the temple, and he presents himself as God and the person that Israel and the world must worship. Uh, then it unfolds in the book of Revelation that you sat under Dr. Brogy's teaching for some time. But at this time, at least, the uh, agreement is broken. The Antichrist now, who appeared as a man of sin, uh, a man of peace, now you see his true colors as the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the man that hates God, the man that hates uh, Israel, and the person who demands the world worship him as God. Now, did you ever notice in scriptures, and you have a perfect picture of it here in the, in the prophetic events, uh, Satan often operates under counterfeit. And if I had a, a slide up there, I'd show you two triangles, and here would be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then I'd show you an uh, unholy trinity. The dragon corresponds to the Father, the uh, a false prophet or the second beast responds to the Holy Spirit and the Antichrist responds to Jesus Christ and becomes the counterfeit. Keep in mind this, the word anti not only means against in the Greek, anti-Christ, that is he's against Christ, but anti is also a word of substitution. It is used of Christ dying anti our sins. In other words, in the place of our sins. And the Antichrist, as a man of peace, comes in the place of Christ, the Messiah. So he claims it now that he's the God of the ages and all of Israel and all the world uh, ought to uh, worship him. So anyway, after the uh, treaty is signed, and then you're going to uh, probably have the temple of Israel, maybe part of the condition, and they can build. You say, how long would it take to build a temple? You can get the exact date in the Old Testament under the uh, prophets of, of uh, Haggai because it's interesting. In Haggai and Ezra, it tells you exactly when the building of the second temple began and how long it took to build it. You know what it was? It began September 21st, 520 B.C. It was finished on March 12, 516. Dr. Charles Dyer wrote this, a construction period lasting almost exactly three and a half years. Isn't that interesting? And so it could be built right there at the time of the beginning because now they can worship again. But then the man of sin is going to use this as a place where he's going to step in and claim to be God and demand that uh, Israel and the world worship him. Now, if this is the correct sequence of prophetic events, 
Then during the first half of the tribulation period, remember, he's a man of peace, promises protection. Israel will be in her land, as she is now, been there since 1948, protected by the strongest military might in the world at that time, with the sacrificial system reinstated in the temple in Jerusalem, and it will be a time of peace and safety. Now, how do I know that? A time of peace and safety, unthreatened by other nations. Listen to Ezekiel 38, and this will be on your slides too, and you can look in your Bible. 38 verses 8, 11, and 14. Ezekiel says, after many days you'll be mustered, in the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from, from war. And the you he's talking about here is not Israel, it's about the invading force leader who's going to come into Israel. You will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples, that's Israel, upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples, and now, now notice these two words, dwell securely, all of them, and say, I will go up against, notice, I've circled these, the land of unwalled villages. Why do you have walls? Why do you have gates? Why do you have bars to keep people out? Because you're not secure. I will fall upon the quiet people, notice again, who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls, having no bars or gates. Therefore, son of man, that's Ezekiel, prophesy and say to Gog, the leader of this coalition, Thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel are dwelling securely, will you not know it? That's why I say Israel is asleep at the wheel. Paul put it this way. When they cry out peace and safety, then judgment is coming very swiftly upon them. They think everything's great. For the first time in our existence, we are dwelling securely in the land. But all at the time, this evil man is devising an evil plan, and God will use him. God can use even his wrath. God can use the ungodly. God can use ungodly leaders to further accomplish his greater purpose. And he's using Gog, the leader of this Islamic coalition, as an instrument to bring chastening upon Israel, and then God is going to destroy him. Now, if I haven't lost you by now, and you can stay with me now, you can just take a deep breath and look at the screen, and I want us to look at this map of the Middle East today. So let's go to the land of the Middle East today. And we can. what I want you to do is I'm just going to mention these names uh, from Ezekiel 38. Now, I'm going to begin in verse 1. Son of man, set your face toward Gog. I'm just going to say for sake of... Uh, of brevity here, that Gog is who I understand to be the leader of this Islamic coalition, okay? It would be like I would say today, there's a, 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 ten nations are coming together over there, or six nations, and you got Hitler leading them. I don't mean literally Adolf Hitler, I mean a man like Adolf Hitler, a dark man, an evil man, a brutal man. And that's who God is, a brutal, everyone knows that about the title of, of, of God. Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And then you jump over, you see Meshach, Tubal. Uh, then you jump down to verse 5, Persia, Cush, uh, Put, Gomer, Beth, Tagmar, etc. And what we're going to do, I don't want you to pay so much attention to the names as some do, but I want you to pay attention to where, where they are located on the Middle East, uh, on the map today. So you got Meshach and Tubal. Then, verse 5, three more nations. Uh, the first one is called uh, Persia. Her name was changed in 1935 when it changed to Iran, the name of the nation today. Then, Cush, you read about, today is Sudan. Some say even Ethiopia with the amount of land it covered. And then put. Well, we say, where do you put put? 2,000 years ago, Josephus, a historian uh, during the time of Jesus, wrote the Antiquities of the Jews, and he said that put is what the Greeks uh, called ancient Libyas, which today is Libya. At the same time, it was much larger, so some also believe it could include Algeria, perhaps Tunisia. 
but we can't be sure. Verse 6, we read of Gomer. Now, that's not the home of Gomer Powell. It's the modern country of Turkey. And now you know why I put the picture of Putin, because we're going to see later three times he mentions this, this nation comes and this leader comes from up in the uttermost northern part. And that would be Russia and the former Soviet Union. So now you see why we put Vladimir Putin, Ayatollah Khomeini, and President Erdogan's picture together because, remember, when biblical prophecy does take place, current events will align with that. So this could be, might be, don't know for sure, the formation coming together that will then result in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Cautionary note, it may not be, okay? So we don't know for certain. But it certainly, if the curtain went up and we went up, everything, the actresses, the actresses, the musicians, they're all in place. And it could unfold just like that, bingo. Joel Rosenberg writes this, Magog settled north of the Black Sea, north of the Caspian Sea, in the regions we call today Russia and some of the former Soviet Union republics. And what did they do? Well, they devised a strategy, and now they're going to launch an invasion of Israel. And so you'll notice on the map, they attack from the north, the east, the south, and the west. Now, isn't that brilliant strategy? You got this little nation, Israel, about the size of New Jersey, and now you got these hordes coming from the north, the east, the west, and the south uh, is surrounded. Now, what possible force could possibly unite people of such ethnic and linguistic diversity as Russians, Turks, Persians, Arabs, Africans, speaking different languages, Russia, Farsi, Swahili, I mean, what could possibly bring them all together? Well, in verses 12 to 13 of Ezekiel 38, you read at least what is written down there, and um, uh, the King James Version commentary states it this way. They say, the development of Israel since 1948 has been phenomenal. It's also a known fact that their mineral wealth in the Dead Sea is of almost incalculable value. Much of it is used for production of fertilizer. These chemicals, together with modern technology and farming by irrigation and increasing amounts of natural rainfall, could make it to be the breadbasket for a large part of the world. Israel also stands at the crossroads of world commerce. Whoever controls Israel could control much more. Now, so they're talking, and Ezekiel's talking even, what motivates them? Well, it's to take the spoil of the land. But I want to suggest to you two deeper reasons why these countries that are so different in language, culture, and historically, and what brings them together in this one united front. Now, keep in mind this also. The Antichrist and the most powerful coalition on earth that made the promise with Israel, the covenant with Israel, that if they attack you, they attack me, as it were. Uh, keep in mind, they're doing it even at that expense unless there's something going underneath the scenes that we know about. But you can believe that if you've got the most powerful military, political mind, with all the sense of, of, of getting information, that they would know about this alliance forming together. But I'm thinking the Antichrist wants to unveil himself sooner or later as the one to be worshipped, who sets himself in the temple demanding worship. So he's probably thinking... Let's hasten the day on because there's no record that he does anything to defend Israel against this invasion, which I'm calling the Islamic uh, invasion. So what I suggest here are this. Here are the two things those nations have in common. One, their hatred for Israel. All those countries I mentioned, every one of them, they hate the nation. They go on record. We will not be satisfied until they are destroyed, annihilated. The only good Jew is a dead Jew. Throw them into the Mediterranean Sea. And that's what this invasion is all about. So they hate the Jew. And also number two they have in mind is they are united fundamentalistic militant Islam is their 
of religion. Look at all those countries that we've mentioned. And Islam is a large portion of what is happening. Different kind, kinds of Islam, maybe. But they're all united in their hatred of Israel, wanting to get rid of the Jew, and then establish, of course, what once was the Ottoman uh, Empire. So you can imagine the anger of militant Islam as Israel now has rebuilt the temple. They're back to the sacrificial system. What's happened to the Dome of the Rock? the sacred uh, monument for Islam? What about Jerusalem, the third most holy city uh, in Islam's religion? Medina, Mecca, and Jerusalem? And so all this brings them together, and Prince Gog, G-O-G, thinks he's worked out the whole scheme, but it's God who's in charge. Because this northern coalition comes into the land of Israel, confident of victory, but they're walking into a trap. It's a, dead tra a death trap. They're walking into a time when God is going to judge those people for touching the apple of his eye. So let's move to the second point, and I'm going to move quickly here. Israel is awakened to God. Israel is awakened to God. So they're asleep to God first. Now through this, they're going to be awakened to God. 38.14 to 39.8. Now, Prince Gog and his horde will swoop down from the north. It says in verse 15 of 38, like a cloud covering the land. You get the idea. They're swarming over it. Totally ignorant that the God of Israel intended their destruction. The Antichrist does nothing. United States, nothing. United Nations says nothing. It says nobody, but nobody, comes to Israel's defense. Except the most important person, and that's the Lord. And he will come and does come to their defense. So having entered the seven-year covenant with Israel, the Antichrist who promised to protect them can't let a crisis go to waste. So after all, his plan all along was to use their temple for his own evil purposes and exaltation and glorification. Now, before the European leader has time to act, let me just summarize uh, what, what God does as he intervenes in his jealous wrath and wipe out the invading forces. Now, let me summarize these verses quickly for you, okay? And you can pick them up and read them uh, if you desire when you get home. Number one, he'll cause an earthquake to be felt around the world. So we read in Ezekiel 38, uh, in verse 19, uh, in my jealousy and my blazing wrath, I declare on that day there shall be a great earthquake. We've seen a little bit of that in Turkey recently. I don't know what the death count is now. Over 40,000, I know that. And this is an earthquake that God, God brings about in the land of Israel. The fish, the birds, the beasts, creeping things, all people shall quake at my presence. Can you imagine? Ever been in an earthquake? Only one for me. It was enough. In the middle of the night, 1 a.m., Bishka, Kyrgyzstan. I'm telling you, you felt, you, you never felt more out of control in your life than when you're in an earthquake. And that was just what I'd probably call, what they'd call a tremor. But this is like when Haggai says, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's almost like he pictures him lifting up earth and shaking it and shaking heaven as well. You can read that in Haggai. And here's an earthquake. And all the people there will quake at my presence. Mountains thrown down, cliffs shall fall. Every wall shall tumble. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the Lord. And then here's result number two, not only the earthquake, but you've got every man's sword will be against his brother. What that? Every military person here, every veteran or present acting military knows what that means. It's killed by friendly fire. It's something every soldier would dread doing. Because of the confusion of warfare, you mistake that he's the enemy, but no, he's not an enemy, he's an ally. He's a member of another unit of the United States Marine Corps. And you shoot that person thinking he's the enemy. Imagine all the confusion. They're speaking Russian, Farsi, 
Swahili, Arabic. God sends the earthquake. Everyone is scared out of their wits. You can imagine the confusion coming about. Now they're killing off each other in the very ally team they are together. With pestilence and bloodshed, he goes ahead. Number three, I will enter into judgment with him and I will, there it is, rain upon him and his hordes and the many people who are with him, torrential rains, hailstorms, fire, and sulfur. Can you imagine fire, sulfur, hailstones dropping down on you all over the place? And so that's what God does to intervene so Israel is spared. Ezekiel 39, 12 says, There are so many corpses, so many dead people in the land, that it will take seven months to bury all of them. Now, while the description of the defeat in chapter 38 focuses on the army of this coalition, when you get to chapter 39, the focus now is on the leader of the coalition. And it's Gog who started out, we saw in chapter 38. So we read in verse 1, God says, I'm I'm against you, O Gog. Can you imagine hearing that from God? Can you imagine if God said to you, I'm against you? You have turned away from my son. You have not, but you have sat under gospel teaching, biblical teaching, and you will not yield. And I have tried to draw you to myself by my spirit, and you have resisted. And there comes that day beyond remedy that Proverbs talks about. And God says, To maybe someone here or listening, I am against you. You don't want God to be against you. You don't want God to be against you. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, Paul says we are enemies of God. That can be changed just like that. By trusting in Christ as your Savior. I'm against you, O God. Verse 3, I will strike your bow from your left hand. I'll make your arrows drop out of your right hand. Verse 4, you shall fall on the mountains of Israel. I will give you to birds of prey of every sort and to the beast of the field to be devoured. Verse 6, I will send fire on Magog. That's the judgment of God coming upon this leader of this confederation. Verse 23, the Lord gives three reasons for bringing Gog and his armies to Israel and then defeating them so dramatically. Number one, this victory will reveal the greatness of the Lord as he displays his power before the nations. You read that at the end of chapter 38, verse 23. So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. They will know that I am the Lord. It will reveal the greatness of the Lord It will reveal his holiness as he deals with unholiness and sinful, wicked behavior of hatred against the Jews. The wealth of the Holy Land belongs to the Lord. He's given it to his people. Israel and other nations have no right to exploit it. That comes out in verse 28, by the way. And then in Ezekiel 39, 7 He says this, In my holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Israel is asleep to God. Israel is now awakened to God. And it ends in chapter 39. Israel is attuned to God. Can't do justice to it, so let me summarize it for you again. The Lord God is revealing his faithfulness, his omnipotence, his holiness, and his glory. As the enemies of Israel are annihilated, Israel recognizes that while no other nation came to their defense, the Lord of heaven and of earth is faithful to his covenants, and Israel puts her trust in him. The sudden destruction of this great army will leave behind a multitude of corpses and military material so that the land needs cleaning up. So that brings us to three things here. Number one, the cleansing of the land. 
peoples from the cities of Israel will go out and gather and burn the weapons and the supplies left by Gog. According to verse 12 of 39, it took seven months that the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Those are the people who were judged by God and they came to destroy Israel. They walked into the trap and now their flesh is seen as being devoured by the animals and the birds of the air. That brings us to their call to the feast, verse 1720. Not all the corpses can be buried immediately, so the carrion eating birds and the beasts enjoy a feast at the invitation of the Lord. The invitation to a feast is a common image used for the judgment of God and his victory over his enemies. So humiliating is this defeat of Gog and his allies that the Lord refers to their officers in what terms? He refers to them as rams, lambs, goats, and bullocks. They arrogantly entered Israel's proud soldiers but would be buried like slaughtered animals. Such is the fleeting greatness of man. Then we end in verses 21 to 29, the compassion of the Lord. He is compassionate. He not only destroyed the invading forces for the protection of his people, but also the demonstration of his glory before the Gentile nations as well. This miracle is also a reminder to the Jews newly returned to the land that Jehovah alone is the Lord. This experience of deliverance will remind them of the many times in the past their ancestors were miraculously delivered by the God of Israel. But the victory over Gog and his hordes will tell the Gentiles the Jews are indeed the chosen people of God who were chastened by God in the past but now destined for a kingdom. And if my timeline is right, about three and a half years later, after the final three years of of the tribulation period, the great tribulation, and when I think of the tribulation period, I think of three words that summarize it for me. What is God's purpose of Daniel's 70th week? What's his purpose of the tribulation period? Three Ps, a preparatory purging process. That's what the seven years is. The final 70th week of judgment Daniel gave. It's a preparatory and it's a purging and it's a process for seven years that will then make them ready when the Son of Man comes and his feet, according to Zechariah 14.4, he descends from heaven And uh, with all the saints with him from before and the holy angels, his feet light upon the Mount of Olives. Some of you have been there. If you haven't been there, you need to go next time. Dr. Brogy uh, leads a group. It'll change your life, I guarantee you. His feet light upon the Mount of Olives. And then that is, is separated into two so that a great valley is formed. It's another study. I saw it on your website, The Judgment of the Nations, Matthew 25. Could it be... The Valley of Jehoshaphat, that as far as I know, is never located in the Bible. That that valley formed when the Lord's feet light on the Mount of Olives and it cleaves the two, separates the two, the east and the west. That valley form becomes the Valley of Jehoshaphat because Jeho means Jehovah. Shaphat is the Hebrew word to judge. What happens immediately after the Lord comes back? The judgment of the nations. Where he gathers all nations of the world, individuals stand before him according to their ethnic group. That's another, you ought to go to the website and check that message out from Dr. Brogy, and you'll get it all straight and clear. Hey, my time's up. I've got to stop now. So I'm going to stop, all right? Let me just uh, say two things, if I may, in closing. It's not, prophecy is not meant just to give information, it's to give motivation. These things are true. This is going to happen could happen in our lifetime. It may not happen in our lifetime. What we do know is the Lord is coming back. What we do know is that before the tribulation period and the second coming to earth, there is that event where the curtain opens, the rapture. First Thessalonians is dedicated to the rapture. Every chapter in First Thessalonians, five of them, ends with the motivation from the, from the, from the uh, rapture. Chapter one, serve God. Chapter two, uh, be sanctified. Be poor. Be a serving people, a sanctified people, a serene people. Be people who know how to comfort one another. 
because of the, in light of the rapture. And I charge you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, more than charging you, I plead with you, come to Christ. Trust Christ as your Savior. You don't want to be part of any of this, of the tribulation period, trust me. And if you're a Christian, I'm telling you what, all I can say is whether it's your money, whether it's your time, your talents, your gifts, whatever it is, whatever it is, sell off to Christ. Declare him the Lord and master of your life. Live for his glory. Live totally to his glory. Use all the resources God has given you to serve him and to live in light of his soon return. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, you've been so very gracious to us. You've been so patient, and we are so glad for that. And Lord, I pray now that your spirit would move, drawing people to Christ as their Savior and believers to him as well as the Lord of their life. Have your way, O Holy Spirit of God. We pray in Christ's name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand as we...